Hi, everyone. It's great for all of our live viewers to join us here at the Hypospadia Specialty Center. We're going to share our screen with you and get started. And we definitely would like to welcome our uh, guest with us all the way from Kuwait. This is Dr. Al Sayed, who's here. Yes. He's been a long time enthusiast for grafting the urethral plate. And so since that's the topic today, then it's natural to invite him to speak and he'll be coming in on that in a few moments. So many times when we're talking about tip, people ask, well, should I graft the urethral plate? And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And let's go back to the very beginning, to the very first session where we said, what, what is the purpose that we should have in mind on any hypospadish repair? And we summarize that by saying, we're going to take abnormal anatomy and make it into normal anatomy. But then we have to define you know, what we mean by that. And so here's what we conclude means you've achieved normal anatomy. You want a straight penis, a slit meatus that's at the tip of the glands, scars that are within the circumcision line and or the median refe, depending on your skin management, and no urethroplasty complications. And last time we showed how distal tip achieves those goals in making a normal penis, it makes a normal meatus, and it provides that normal glands fusion or bridging, however you refer to that between the meatus and the corona of the glands. And we also emphasize that the shape of the urethral plate does not matter, does not matter. And neither does the width of the urethral plate matter. And neither does some poorly defined definition of quality of the urethral plate make any difference either. The people who talk about poor quality, when we pin them down and said, well, define that to me so I can see with my eyes what you see with your eyes, it never, you know, well, it's poor, you know, poor spongiosum or something that, again, we're not all going to see in the same way. And so all of that led to this conclusion from our standpoint that we don't really worry about what the specific anatomy of the distal hypospadias looks like as long as the penis is straight, as long as the penis is straight. So all of these boys with varying types of glandular and meatal anatomy can all have a tip repair. And that's great because then we don't have to go back to the old days of saying, well, do I do a Matu? Do I do an advancement? Do I do a magpie? Do I do all these various techniques, we can do a tip repair. And as long as we do it right, then we should achieve that goal of having normal anatomy. And of course, we showed also that many have achieved that goal yeah. with an average complication rate and meta-analysis of thousands of patients of about four and a half percent. So it's not just us. It's not a unique ability that we have. This is surgeons all over the world, three, over 3,000 in a meta-analysis to patients, and they got the same results that we've published. But what we want to also emphasize is that the, the tip repair does not result in urethral strictures, and that's been a concern that people express from the very beginning. Some people still try to harp on that and say it's going to happen. But here's a meta-analysis of published papers from around the world that shows it's in fact a very uncommon complication. But this is what originally drove the idea of grafting the urethral plate, that there's this raw de-epithelialized surface and a concern that that was going to scar down and cause obstruction. And you've got that tissue that many cases is going to be discarded in a circumcision. Why not take some and graft the tip incision with it? And that led to more people doing G-tip in different ways. And Dr. Al-Sayed is going to talk about 
his preference because he likes the way it makes the meatus. So he'll discuss that. And other people have talked about reducing stenosis and these other things. It noticed that the reason was it might stricture, but since it doesn't stricture, you know, we don't get neurethral strictures. Now people are using other reasons to do it, but fair enough. That's in their mind, the reasons they want to graft the urethral plate. But there's been almost no studies that have compared directly TIP and G-TIP and, and none that have really shown that you need to do grafting of it to improve results over a TIP repair. So just to review, these are our results for distal TIP. These were all patients with distal hypospadias with curvature less than 30 degrees. We didn't use any other technique. So we have not used G-TIP ever in a primary patient, and there's our results. And so we still do TIP for all distal repairs, and we still have a low complication rate. So again, the technique done correctly, done correctly, has few complications, and we keep emphasizing that to some critics around the world that the patients they see are having complications are having them not because the technique is flawed, but because the surgeon is making a technical error, which is usually not incising the plate deeply enough. Or doing tip in patients with curvature. Curvature, that's right. And here's the end result of tip repair. And you can see looking at this, that these boys meet that criteria that we established of having normal anatomy. All of these boys have normal anatomy. All of them have normal fusion of the glands under the meatus. So they've all achieved the result we want. But there's a couple of them where the result isn't perfect. There's one of them and here, well, sorry. There, there's one and here's the other. And you see that in those cases, the meatus is down just a little bit from the tip of the glands where it is in all the other cases. And I think when uh, Nasser has talked to me about his preference for G-tip, that this is what really stimulated him was seeing boys with these kind of results like this and like that and thinking he can avoid that by extending the incision and grafting it. And he will talk about that in just one moment. But before that, I just have to say that, you know, nothing is perfect, nothing works every time. And these are patients we've seen, again, as Dr. Bush just said, we haven't done a grafting. I mean, we use grafts every day, we just haven't grafted a tip incision in a primary case. And, but we have seen a few boys where it was done. And here's one where the uh, graft is protruding a bit from the meatus. And here's one that had glands dehiscent. And that's a bad enough complication. But then on top of that, that graft that was put in it kind of became exuberant and gave a really odd appearance. And we know that all graphs, all graphs will sometimes contract. And so ironically, for those who started out doing this to avoid strictures, at least in an occasional patient, they may make a stricture because they put the graph there and that's been reported uh, by another author that you see here. So in any event, Nasser and I and his colleague Mabdou Ahmed have been having this friendly discussion back and forth for many years. You see, I'm visiting their unit and their studies, they've got me surrounded and they're trying to convince me you have to start grafting these tip incisions. So now we'll turn it over to Nasser and let him present his views. Go right ahead. Well, hi, everybody. Um, I would like uh to thank um, Warren and Nicole for allowing me to be part of this masterclass. Um, well, uh, to start with, um, GTIP has uh, other, um, I mean, similar words, people using like dorsal inlay graft or um, a, a snod graft. 
Now, um, the question uh, which was raised um, uh, by Warren, why to go for GTEP? Just to give you an idea uh, about uh, our center uh, we're working in, uh, we're working uh, in a center with uh, seven operating room uh, a week. Um, we do an average of four to five hypospadias cases per week. Uh, this include distal and proximal. And we are uh, around four surgeons who's uh, doing those uh, hypospadias uh, surgeries. Um, our waiting list is long, around two years. Um, uh, and really we have a huge volume in our area. I'm not sure uh, the reason. Uh, I'm sure it's, it's more than uh, what you have there in, uh, in your uh, areas. Um, now, to come to the question, uh, why GTEP? Um, I stolen a photo from uh, Dr. Snodgrass' presentation uh, where uh, <laughs> this is exactly what I see in the clinic, where the meatus, if you can see um, the arrow, or the mouse, you can see the meatus a little bit looking down, although there is a good fusion down here. Can you see my, uh, my, my mouse here? No, but I'm trying to do it for you here. Okay, so you can, you can follow me. So it's a little bit down, and it needs to move two, three millimeter dorsally. This is what stimulates us to go for a GTEP. Our complication rate on the tip um, was almost the same like the GTEP. Um, my partner, uh, when he started doing the GTEP, um, his symptom, I mean, his, his outcome uh, or complication rate significantly dropped. This is not the case in my cases or in my, in my hyperspadius repair. So now to, to, because you can tell in the literature there are Papers are saying that GTEP a little bit more um, or giving less complication than TEP. This is not what I experienced. Um, although my partner um, significantly, uh, the GTEP dropped his complication rate rather than the TEP. So now if we move to the next slide, um, how to do it right? Well, um, if you can uh, see the picture on um, the right side, no, the other one, the, yes, okay. Um, you can tell the way we're doing our meatus. It's different than uh, Dr. Snodgrass and uh, Nicole, how they're doing it. We first, uh, we determine where is the meatus it should be. And the point we, we go for, it's where the glands divert. Um, you know, the glands comes in two direction. First, this direction, let me see if I, if my finger, first it comes this direction and then it goes vertical. Okay, so so at this point, exactly, at this point where it's changed, the glands change direction. This is where we plan the meatus. And you can see in the other photo where we mark this is exactly the point where the glands change direction. And this is where we incise the glands and we never incise distal to that. We don't have meatal stenosis. Our meatal stenosis is almost zero. Uh, this is with the tip because we're doing this technique with the tip. But when, once we change to GTEP, just to move the meatus more in optimum position, not to have cases where the meatus a little bit looking down, still we're doing the same technique. So um, when we uh, incise, we don't go beyond uh, that point. If we move to the other, uh, to the other um, slide. Now, this is another view on the side of you where you can see it's more clear. Um, this photo on the left where, yes, exactly. You can see how the glands changing direction, vertical and then oblique. At that point where we do our incision and we don't dissect anything distal to that point. 
So now, uh, how to do it right? We, we do extensive dissection of the glans wings, which is both for tip and G-tip, um, that the glans will be open like a book for you. Um, it will be more difficult, uh, our dissection, rather than Dr. Snodgrass dissection, because Dr. Snodgrass goes more, dissect the glands more distally. So it will be easier for him to dissect the glands. We do, we do it this way, but we really dissect the glands up to the point we're incising. The most important point where we end or we start the distal incision there, we dissect the glands exactly in that point so extensive. The other point is we do a deep incision of the lateral plate, same like a uh, tip. And then we incise the glands proper two millimeter distal to the lateral plate. I believe that there are cases, the primary hypospadias cases where the lateral plate does not end where it should be to be an optimum external meatus. To the next. Uh oh, well, wait a second. It seems like there might be an internet connection. Nasser, we're waiting for you to reconnect a bit here. Hello? Now you're back. You froze okay. for a moment. Still this is, this is, uh, I, I wonder, Nick, just go to the, the urethra. Nasser, we'll give you a second to see. Oh, there, now it looks like you're back. Nasser, are so, you there? Hello? Yes, we can hear you, but you're just cutting in and out a little bit. So we'll have you talk okay. for a second. Okay, so. So where is the joining the urethral plate? And um, yes, exactly. So yes, exactly. This is the edges of where the graft joining the urethral plate. And uh, one of the points that when we close with 7.0 PDS, we include the graft, but we don't include the urethral plate. We just comes to the side of the urethral plate. So we don't incorporate our stitches with it exactly where, where Nicole is pointing with the mouse. And if you go distally, you see our incision. Um, distally, you see this is the two millimeter where we incise and it gives you a really an elliptical, beautiful, optimal meatus there. Um, if you can see the glandular wings dissection, and our future meatus, if you go horizontally from the tip there to the tip there, this is our future meatus. And I believe that this is an important point to get a wide elliptical meatus where the resistance of the urine when it voided, there is very least resistance. And this will bring your complication rate very low by not having a pressure in your suture line. And quilting, we quilt only in the middle. We quilt only in the middle, maybe one, two, three stitches. So if we can move to the other slide. This is another view, just to tell you where is the graft, the urethral plate. Usually urethral plate is, you know, um, a three, four millimeter. So you cannot incorporate your stitch width it has to be at the side of the urethral plate. And this is the ventral dartus flap, which usually we take it uh, from the ventral uh, surface. And you can imagine how is the meatus going to be. If you put a horizontal line, this is where we take our stitch exactly. This is our first stitch in that point, um, a little bit below the mouse, a little bit below. Yes, exactly. This is what the urethral plate we bring the two point, and you can imagine how is the meatus gonna be wide. 
And again, I'm stressing in this point, you, will, you want the least resistance. When you're in, you know, when the child voided, that there is no resistance to the future line, which will bring your complication rate very low. So we'll go next slide. This is our goal. Our goal is to have a circumcised looking penis with a nice fusion ventrally. And um, one point I forget to mention, when you graft, at the first cases we're grafting, we're grafting a little bit more distally, like three, four millimeter distally. And then we ended with having, you know, a graft looking like a tongue outside the meatus. This is in our first few cases, not anymore. Most of our cases, I would say 96 of our cases, this is cosmetically how they look like. We've been doing this GTIP over 10 years now, and we have a huge experience in that, and we are so happy with that technique. I'll move to the next slide. Yeah, we did a study in 2015, um, published in General Pediatric Urology, where we have 230 cases, and we follow up for five th to 36 months. We get a success rate of 96%, excellent cosmetic and functional uh, result. Our fistula rate was around 4%, no meatal stenosis and no urethral diverticulum. At that time, we were not recording our data, uh, I mean, by saying um, gland size, urethral plate width, and um, uh, uh, Cordy, we, we are not measuring Cordy by Johnny meter. And then if you move to the next slide, uh, thanks to uh, Warren, when he visited us um, in Kuwait, he motivated us and encouraged us to keep a data for all hypospadias cases. And this is what we've been doing for the last two years now. We have a prospective uh, study going on, over 200 patients. And we're putting all these data for all hypospadias cases, distal or proximal. You can see the points we're going for gland width, meatal position, Cordy degree measurements with a Johnny meter, and um, Cordy, how it's corrected, urethral plate width, graft length width, position of the graft over corpotomies. Um, because now some data showing in the literature that grafting over corpotomies can affect your success rate. So we're, we're studying this and um, we'll see our results. Measurements of the graft post-surgery, length and width, urethral plates, uh, width post-incision after incising, this is when we do a GTEP, and glands fusion below meatus after surgery. So all those points we do for all our hyperspedious cases and hopefully in near future, we'll publish our results. We have uh, another study going on, future um, uh, GTEP and urine flow study. Uh, I'm not sure if this is going to make a difference in the flow study, GTEP, but our preliminary results and seeing the videos, we're asking the parents to video their kids voiding in, in toilet age, um, in toilet trained age patient. And um, their flow is excellent. Um, straightforward with good stream. So uh, this is encouraging um, a point if we prove that it makes a difference to go for uh, GTEP. Next. Well, I would like to thank you all for, uh, I mean, listening and I hope that I added uh, to your information something in hyperspadius. Thank you. Now we thank you. And I, I mean, that was a great summary and and um, a good explanation of some important points. We couldn't agree with you more that how you make that meatus is so critical to avoiding meatal stenosis. And you don't have meatal stenosis, we don't have meatal stenosis. And, and so it just shows that a surgeon who's having it more often is doing something that can be improved upon. And so again, this is kind of, the whole thing in hypospadias surgery, if any surgeon watching this is having more complications than what we're talking about, then there's probably something in that person's technique that could be improved. 
Because if we compare TIP and what you have just presented with GTIP, I mean, they both have low complication. They are both creating normal anatomy with a normal appearance. Tip, you don't have to graft, but you've said, you know, grafting is not difficult. You do it all the time. You're used to doing it. And where we live, some people want a foreskin reconstruction. You live where nobody wants a foreskin <laughs> reconstruction. So, you know, so this is just, kind of a comparison side by side. Well, and I, I do think that that's an important point because some of you watching live in countries where no one really, or, or very few want a circumcision, that the normal appearance in that location is a propitioplasty. So there is probably the major difference in terms of your outcomes for a tip versus a G-tip. I have a very difficult time imagining how you would harvest a foreskin graft and reconstruct the foreskin in a functional fashion. So if it's normal to have foreskin covering the glands, then you really want to rethink your definition of things because now you're outside of normal and you're not doing the appropriate reconstruction if you don't keep that in mind. So this is when we look at it, and as I say, we've had many discussions over the years, and what we see, and, and I think you alluded to it, that some of your partners had a higher complication rate with TIP that came down when they started doing GTIP, and we would interpret that in this way. We know that surgeons who come visit us from other places who are having some complications with TIP, that they come and they watch us do one operation and go, oh my gosh, I thought I was incising the urethral plate deep like you talk about, but clearly I wasn't. And, and we discussed that in the last session and even should publish pictures from other articles where the surgeons did not incise the urethral plate deeply. So we would say the benefit of a G-tip in, in that circumstance is just getting surgeons to make the deep incision because then they're not afraid of it because they know they're going to graft it. So And it's it, it, you have to incise it deeply in order to have enough room for your graft. If you did a really superficial incision, there's just a little tiny not graft. room to put the graft in there. So I think those are two technical points. Yeah. So what's the answer to this question? Do we tip or G-tip? We've had the debate back and forth. Who is the winner? And this is what we would say that we've already said, tip achieves normal anatomy. And G-tip achieves normal, normal anatomy. anatomy. As Nasser has just proven. So they both work. So what do you do? Well, so I think this is really an important point, and that's why we wanted to do this session and why we specifically wanted to invite Dr. Al Saeed, because we know that both of us are taking a slightly different approach and ending up in the same place, and that's okay. And I think, again, all of that's okay when a circumcised appearance is, is your cultural norm, right. I'm going to say there's a little caveat that if a circumcised appearance isn't the cultural norm, that there is going to be a difference because the whole point of hypospadias repair, besides the functional aspect of things, is reconstructing to a normal appearance that's typical for where that boy is going to grow up. And if he's going to look different in the bathroom because he's circumcised where lots of kids on either side of him are natural, then I think you have to take a step back and say, if they both achieve the same results, why on earth would you do something that would compromise their ultimate aesthetic appearance for things when you don't have to? So that's just a little caveat that's more important in some countries than it is in others. And in fact, maybe we should have said, I'm sorry, go ahead. If you allow me just to uh, yes. um, the points here for meatal stenosis. Uh, I think one of the reasons of meatal stenosis that um, some surgeons will incise distal to lethal plate and mm -hmm. they feel very happy uh, that they have a wide meatus 
uh, but they're forgetting that whatever they incise beyond or distal to the rotator plate, this is going to scar. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one point um, uh, needs to avoid. If you're doing tip, do not incise beyond the rotator plate. Otherwise, um, you will be happy that, uh, you know, it's a wide um, uh, meatus allowing, you know, to come over an eight uh, fringe, but whatever you incise, distal rotator plate going to scar and you will end with amiatal stenosis. So just this point to mention, if you're doing tip, this is not the case in, in our G-tip. Actually, we, we incise intentionally um, uh, beyond the atrial plate to move the meatus a little bit um, uh, distal. And that's a really interesting point. It, it kind of begs the question, would wound healing be different inside the urethra where a moist environment on a regular basis is going to be encountered versus that outside of, you know, if you go too far distal, is there a difference somehow in, in how those tissues heal? And I don't know that we have the answer to that. I don't know if anyone does, but, but it is a really interesting point. And it again goes to the idea that these specific technical details are important. I mean, Everybody that does hypospadias surgery is aware that it's very technically demanding and small errors can end up with big complications. And that's why we're doing this masterclass series. That's why we're inviting other people like Dr. Al Saeed to share his perspective and say, make his points of what he's learned are important. And, and at the end of the day, if you do G-tip right and you're in a cultural milieu where that's acceptable, or if you do tip right, and, and you know, whether you do it with a for puceoplasty or a circumcision, we should, we should end up in the same place. Maybe we're going to have a few boys with the meatus down just a little bit than, uh, than uh, Nasser is going to have. And so that's an important consideration to keep in mind. So any event, when I wrote up there, the choice is the surgeon's preference. As we're talking, I should have put in parentheses, and moms. Because, you know, if you make a penis that's perfect, except it doesn't look like the other penises in that society, then that boy is still going to feel different. And, and that's part of what we're trying to avoid in hypospadias repair. The other thing is, and I'm so pleased that, um, that Dr. Al Saeed and his group are monitoring their results. Everyone knows we monitor our results and we always encourage everyone who's watching this today or in the future on the recording that you be stimulated to say, okay, I've heard it enough. I'm going to look at my results and see what they are because you just don't know if you're making a technical error until you look at your results and find out. So that's today's class and we'll be able to take some questions and um, Nasser will be happy to answer questions too. We're just gonna let you know that we're gonna wrap up this master class series on distal hypospadias with this topic coming up in uh, early December. And Dr. Bush told me we have to do a, a thing on skin management because it's not talked about very much. And, and we all know we deal with skin management in every patient, but in when you go to conferences and workshops and stuff, it, it just gets passed over. So we're gonna spend one whole session looking at these technical points and, and these variations and how they impact type of space repair. And Dr. Bush is gonna lead the way on that because she has a special ability with it. And then after that, we're going to go on to proximal hypospadias. I was going to say, at the end of the year, we'll be finishing up our distal you know, portion of things, and then we'll move on to proximal hypospadias for the next year. So we're going to go on. We It looks like maybe have a couple of questions. And so let's go ahead and uh, get started on that. Let's see. Okay, so this first question involves what happens when you accidentally make a hole in the urethral plate um, when you're dissecting your gland swings. At least I, I think that's what yeah. it's referring to. And yet we've all had that happen, no, no <laughs> doubt about it. 
So what we do um, is we close that hole usually with a 9-0-vicryl. I think you could probably use a 7-0-vicryl um, the same way. So just a couple of little interrupted sutures. And fortunately, because your glands is going to go over that, it, it seems as though that typically heals quite well. So just being, you know, that's partly why we do our dissection with scissors so that we can see each cut and reassess. And if we're in the wrong spot, hopefully we haven't made a huge incision into that urethral plate laterally. Hopefully it's something that's small that we can close with a, an interrupted suture or two. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Al-Sayed, do you have anything different on that? Uh, actually, uh, I agree with the, what you said, but uh, we we proceed with the GTEP. Um, we we graft, and um, uh, as you mentioned, Nicole, that uh, the side hole um, will be covered or will be lined with the glands, so it will not be um, that significant. So well, it's, it's a big hole. So if you have a, a hole there and you know you're going to put the graft. Do you throw a few stitches to close the hole first before you graft, or you just put the graft over it? No, the graft, the graft going to be in the raw surface. So right. Um, yeah. So um, um, I will close the hole and then uh, put uh, the graft. And uh, your point about making the G tip makes us making the incision deeper. I believe it's correct because. Um, we're putting if you can see our graft it's it's really wide yes and, uh, wide because we're going really deep um, uh, so uh, uh, yeah this is this is what we do so yeah i want to emphasize that when we close those little holes on the side of the urethral plate and sometimes they're not so little every now and then they're a little bit longer than you wish they were but we're, we're, there's no attempt to make that water tight. When we put those couple of stitches, we're just aligning it together because again, we know that we're gonna cover it with our dartos, we're gonna cover it with the glands. And, and you know, we have not seen that present post-operative problems. It's exceptionally rare to see a fistula in the glands, glands. right? Most fistulas are going to occur in that subcoronal region. And so I think it's very different how watertight your closure is at the you know, more proximal aspect of your midline closure versus something on the side in the glands. There's just more meat that's going to cover that. So the next question is, I'm sorry, Nasser, go ahead. Does this affect your decision of keeping the catheter or the stent longer? No. No, it we, doesn't for us. We do a week really more or less on our on our distal hypospadiasis regardless. I, ha I have cases uh, where uh, the stent came inadvertently um, two days after the repair mm -hmm. and three days after the repair. I didn't put the stent back right. the stent trips, and things went fine. And I noticed something uh, when we start doing GTIP, uh, when we take the stent out, we will be surprised if the patient or the baby cries in the first void. So I tell you, even the first void, it's a painless one. And this tells you that it's, you have a really a wide, nice meatus. This is not our experience with the tip. The tip, you know, maybe the first one, two days, the baby's crying and struggling. We're assuring the parents. Nothing happened, no fistulas, but still the baby will have trouble and, you know, for the first uh, two two days uh, passing urine. I don't know if this is the same experience you have. No. And, uh, I don't think so. Yeah, we, we actually went for uh, almost two years doing our tip repairs in, in infants without a stent at all, um, because you know there is some data that suggests that you don't need to use a catheter in distal hypospadias repair. And we did not find that there was any increased urethroplasty complications. We weren't seeing fistulas or glands dehiscence more often. Or more pain or phone calls or yeah, really anything. I mean, and and you know. we would know because we take all of our, our patient phone calls at <laughs> night. Um, for the pain. 
the pain post stent removal. So yeah. I don't, don't recall that being a problem. But we also have them void, you know, in the tub. If there's any question, you know, that we just tell them to soak and they can urinate there. And I don't know if that makes a difference or not. But now we, because we had more skin issues without leaving the catheter in place, we were having a, a more difficult time getting a good bandage on. We went back to replacing the catheter, but if the catheter inadvertently comes out early, we tell the families it's not a, a major issue at all. We don't replace it either in distals. That is different in proximal longer urethroplasty repairs where if a catheter comes out in the first couple of days, we do replace it. It's just, there's so much edema and a long um, urethroplasty. Yeah, I think if, if our patients are experiencing pain with initial voiding, it must go away pretty quickly because as she said, we don't have trainees or nurses receiving our phone calls I and mean, we get them. And, and neither of us are recalling a mom sent, you know, contacting us and saying he's really hurting when he pees. I mean, we see it after a fistula repair when we don't leave a catheter. Sometimes that first time or two, they're more aware of some discomfort that happens. Just like, I mean, if you're a woman and you've had a child, you know that they, they often put a catheter in during childbirth. And when that catheter comes out, I think it does burn and sting a little bit the first time. And so, uh, you know, it, it wouldn't surprise me just even related to the catheter itself that there may be some irritation that's there but I don't think we've seen a specific difference in phone calls from a graft repair after a catheter removal, for instance, where the whole thing is grafted versus a tip repair. I, I can't recall that. The next question is also for you. Can a graft contracture, if you do a G tip and the graft contracts, would that cause meatal stenosis? So I think you said you don't see meatal stenosis. That's correct, and this tells us that um, the chances of having a graft contracture is very low. Very low. Uh, but I guess if this happened, you will end with meatal stenosis because once it's scarred, uh, um, uh, I don't. Uh, we didn't have meatal stenosis, um, and we're 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 assuming uh, that our graft cake is good. Usually, we use the inner prepuce. Um, um, I don't use when I when I stage when I stage, I go for the outside uh, prepucial. Um, right. But when we do a G tip, we go for the inner prepucial, which is you know mucosal uh, kind of. So to answer the question, um, uh, I'm assuming if the graft contracted, we'll have meatal stenosis. But uh, this didn't happen uh, with us, and this tells you that the take is uh, uh, well. Well, and from my perspective, if you put in a graft, but you don't necessarily need it because you've got your normal urethral plate on either side, even if you lost 50% of your graft, you're probably going to have a sufficient amount of room, you know, because when you incise deeply, your urethral plate is going to go from six millimeters to 12 or 14 millimeters. Your graft is probably going to be six, seven millimeters wide. Have you measured the graphs when you place them in a G-tip at the white eight point? Eight millimeters. It goes for okay. eight. Okay. okay, so if you've got an eight millimeter wide graph plus four on either side, that's 12, and your graph shrunk 50%, now you're going, you know, four plus four, you still have an eight millimeter width, which is an eight French urethra, which is normal for a prepubertal patient. One point I didn't mention that we do our uh, repair over a 10 uh, French um, feeding tube and we leave an eight uh, French. And we're so happy with that, um, I mean, approach. I know that you do it with six French and right. you do it not tight. I mean, you're putting six French, but you're doing um, a diameter of maybe eight uh, French. Uh, yeah. But this is even 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 the glands when we do the glandoplasty, it's over a ten uh, French, and then after we finish the glandoplasty, we go for uh, um, changing it to an eight uh, French and uh, uh, regular feeding tube, and um, uh, things are okay. Would you explain again how you I, it, you said that you don't stitch the edge of the urethral plate, you stitch 
the edge of the graft. Was that yeah. in the urethroplasty or just securing the graft? No, when, when you put the graft, I mean, you, you do your deep incision. Right. And then it will, be, it will be open like this. The plate right. will be open like this. This is one limb and the other limb. So when you put your graft in the middle, um, we, the side of the, the, side of the, um, uh, the plate, we don't incorporate it. Um, we don't incorporate the edge. We just go like, you know, a subcuticular. Okay, you don't involve the, you, Got you. don't involve the, because it's, it's a four millimeter or sometimes three millimeter. If you right. have a stitch, you will not have um, a place for urethroplasty to, to be done. Got you. Okay, yeah. that's clear. Yeah, we've done the same with inlays and redos where we often will stitch it to this, to this submucosa, not the actual epithelium for securing the graft, but you're still saying as you make the urethroplasty, you're sewing the urethral plate edges yes. to each other on the ventral yes. surface. Yeah, so, so in other words, I will, I will suture the edge of the graft to the raw surface mm -hmm. area beside the plate. Got it. Right. Got it. And I think that answers one of the questions here. And then the other one is which side the propitial graft gets placed? I think maybe they're just asking is the epithelial side up, up or, or down? down. Um, actually, uh, the way uh, the way it goes, I mean, um, you know, um, uh, the outside it's outside. So and the, and the, the floor. Um, uh, so so it's it's the natural way. Where is the where is the um, inner prepusion? Look outside. So outside is outside, and the, the bed is the, to the graft. So the uh, inner the, the inner prepuse, the mucosal side of it would go down on the dorsal aspect of the penis, uh, and the epithelial side of it would go into what will become the neo-urethra. Yeah, but um, uh, uh, when we do G tip, it's not that big enough to to to. There is no need for the outside or the epithelial the outside right. prepuse. The inside will be more than enough. You, you you need only eight millimeter. No, I'm just talking about on your actual graft. You know, there's two sides. Just like people ask when we do a tunica vaginalis, do you put the shiny side up or the dull side up? And for that, we don't think it makes a big difference. But for a graft, it could make a really big difference if you put the epithelial side onto the dorsum because epithelium is going to shed you're going to still make cells and that would be a problem if you sewed that to the dorsal right. surface of the penis you could end up with an in fact i would be really surprised if you didn't end up with an inclusion cyst that had developed under there so you have to make sure the epithelial side is inside the urethra absolutely the epithelial sides will be the lumen side of the yes. of the urethra yeah yeah good Okay, well, I think that um, answered people's questions. Yes. Yeah. Oh, there's one, oh, more. one more. Let's see. Ah, is there any thinning of the inner percutial graft needed, or do you use the full thickness of the inner percutial skin? There is, there is some dartus, not much. Um, and uh, we, we, we clean that dartus. Um, so um, we don't keep the artists there. Um, it's not like the outside prepusher. The outside prepusher, there is more dartus, um, but still there will be a dartus in the inner prepusher and we shave that. Do you shave it before you harvest it or yeah. after? Before. It's much easier yeah. to shave it. <laughs> it is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for those of you who haven't worked with prepusial grass, Thin them before you detach them. <laughs> They're much easier. That way. It would be very difficult. Yes, very difficult. And there really, to your point, isn't much to, to thin do, no. on an inner propitial graft. The outer propitial skin, there definitely is it's a layer some. that you'll remove. But the inner propitial, once you really have separated it from the outer propitial, that, that probably is the main thing you have to do, I, I'm assuming. Yes. Um, well, you need to shave, not much to shave from the artist. 
um, because if it's bulky, it will protrude outside. You don't need a bulky uh, mucosa. If it's bulky, it will protrude outside. This is from our experience. So, so we we take the dartus from the inner prepuce, although it's not much. Yeah. Well, that's a good technical point because when we use the outer prepuce for some of our, you know, stag and then post stack repairs, sometimes you can see that it will bulk up just a little bit. It's not a lot, but right, right. at that yeah. neomeatus, you know, that is something that I could imagine would be visible. So good. All right. Well, I think we've answered the questions. And again, uh, Dr. Al Saeed, we really appreciate you doing this with us. I think that's been really instructive for folks and hopefully made it all clear. And so thanks. And we'll say goodbye to everybody and uh, remind you that the next one will be in December. So be watching for that. Great. Bye. Uh, okay. Bye bye.